So hello everybody and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. You might hear I've already got a giggle in my voice, um, but Chris and I have already started talking slightly offline. Um, and in this this podcast has been a very long time coming, so I'm really excited to announce, obviously, um, on the podcast today with me is Chris Ortega, um, from, who is the CEO of Fresh FBA. Um, you will have probably have seen his videos on LinkedIn, amongst other things, um, but really excited to have you on, Chris. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Really excited for this conversation. Yeah, I, I, I will just say it's pretty much going to be 40, 40 minutes of us chatting away. So, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about yourself, you know, obviously your journey to becoming a fractional CFO. So, uh, you know, how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, so I've spent over 17 plus years in accounting, finance, FP&A, and uh, financial leadership. Um, started off my career in public accounting, which was a great opportunity. Did that for a little over six to seven years in both public accounting and corporate accounting. Then I quickly realized I really love like the forward thinking, like finance side, um, which was uh, coming from my undergrad. So I moved over into FP&A, had the opportunity to work at a enterprise level, publicly traded pharma drug development company. And then spent probably like the next six to seven years uh, of that, just like building and growing kind of like SaaS businesses. So most of my background has always been in like high growth, entrepreneurial SaaS based businesses, seed, startup, scale up to enterprise level SaaS companies. Um, And most recently, I was part of a marketing platform company, an international marketing platform company, um, built that all the way up and then actually led it to acquisition to SAP. Uh, which was a really, really great opportunity. First time in my career to like build and shape something completely from scratch and to have a pretty big exit with SAP. Um, And then Hannah, I got to this point in my career where I was like, man, I've built and shaped so many different organizations. I know what financial transformation means. I know all the good, the bad, the ugly that comes along with it. And I felt that there needed to be a fresh perspective on finance. There needed to be a fresh perspective on finance, FP&A, and the office of the CFO. Um, so earlier this year, I started Fresh FP&A, and uh, I've been, you know, building and shaping the business, have an opportunity to work with a lot of different global clients, um, and really, really having the opportunity to write the legacy of what it means to be a finance FP&A and CFO professional of the future. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and my journey. Oh, and can I just say for those that are listening to listening to the podcast rather than watching, Chris has a very awesome t-shirt called The Freshest in Finance. So on that topic, <laughs> tell me a little bit about your fresh perspective. Where do you see that CFO role going in finance? Yeah, so I, I, I love this question and I have a lot of, and, and I like to break it down in different phases. So Phase one was what was the value proposition of the CFO pre-pandemic, right? When you look at the office of the CFO, right? Our value proposition, we were the budget keepers. We were, you know, the scorekeepers. We were the finance gurus of the organization, right? Um, and that was our value proposition. That's what we That's what we brought. We were responsible for the financial due diligence and accuracy of the financial statements and the finances of the business. That was our mantra. Then the pandemic happened. And then when the pandemic happened, I remember being at a high growth technology company and the CROs, the chief marketing officers, the chief sales officers, they were like, look, there's so much uncertainty. There is chaos. We don't know how to manage and navigate this uncertainty and change. And that's where this office of the CFO stepped up. We stepped up to navigate the business. We were able to turn complexity and to clear, concise conclusions. We were able to collaborate inside the business. We were able to build a connection, right? We upskilled the office of the CFO. And now you look at this next phase, we set that new baseline. The business now is no longer going to go back to the, to the CFO to be the record keeper, to be the scorekeeper, to be the one that's just only setting the numbers, to not be collaborative, to not be technology Uh, adopters, to not be great collaborators or communicators, we set the new baseline. So looking at this next phase going forward, it's a huge opportunity for the CFO to entrench themselves inside the business, right? One of the most important aspects of the office of the CFO going forward is our business acumen and understanding, right? Um, How do we turn business pain into productivity? How do we support the operations? To me, 
I think the new definition of the CFO of the future is clarity for operations. How do we bring that clarity in the business? How do we collaborate, connect, bring clarity in an ever-changing and uncertain environment that we're in now? So to me, I think those are the different phases and the different evolutions of the office of the CFO. Yeah, and it's an, it's a really interesting piece, isn't it? Um, and I don't know how much is um, the pandemic driving this change or how much of this change was already in motion and actually happening before the pandemic happened. Because if you think, I think the pandemic accelerated the change, but exactly. a lot of the conversations that we started, if I think about the conversations I was having with people before the pandemic, they knew that where they wanted to be, but I don't think any of us in finance and in, you know, and in finance transformation figured we'd have the last couple of years that we had in terms of the degree of change that we've seen. It's been absolutely bonkers in terms of how much finance has moved um, in, in, in this period. And what I found really interesting, what you said, I think that Clarity is the challenge, isn't it? Because there is so much uncertainty um, and that ability to shift and to to gather across. And not just, I, and you said operationally, but I also think there's a big strategic element to what the CFO Definitely. needs to do and needs to bring. And, you know, sitting next, when you have to go toe to toe with that CRO and talk to him about where he should be focusing his efforts, that, you know, you've got to have that strategic hat on. Well, most definitely, most definitely. And to your first point that you mentioned, right? Like I share this a lot. I think the pandemic was that accelerating event because like I remember be before the pandemic, like I've always been a finance leader. I've always looked at collaboration. I've always looked at side the finance organization. I've always built my teams to not just be like financial professionals, but great finance business partners, right? I've always done that. And you've, you've seen it in pockets, right? And when the pandemic happened and people were going remote and industries were there and like, you know, there was so much like just globally that was happening. And when you seen that those CROs and those 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 revenue driving uh, functions inside the business and said, like, look, we this is uncharted territory for us. Those CFOs that were already preaching the new philosophy and leaving new legacies, they were like, it's our time. Right. And to me, I think like we this is our 15 minutes of fame for the office of the CFO to <laughs> modernize, to 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 leverage technology, to look at, you know, what I look at as the six pillars of financial transformation, which are people, process, partnership. Those are the foundation pillars. The scaling pillars are going to be platform, performance, and profit. These are really the, the, the framework and how modern CFOs can really take like this idea of, of transformation and take this idea of, of meeting this new business demand in a framework that they can go implement inside their organization to upskill that value proposition. So it's 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 our 15 minutes of fame. Let's get it. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. And I think you're 100% right. And I also think you're 100% right in that there is a finite opportunity for us, for finance mm -hmm. to step up. Because if finance doesn't step up right now, it's going to fall to one of the other teams. If finance don't get hold of the analytics and the data um, and the, like you say, the operational capability of the business and tie that into the strategic goals, then, you know, there is, there is somebody that will step in and do it. Because you you do see that kind of that that crossover between, like you say, the CRO, that C-suite looking at revenue and profit and strategy. Um, and, you know, there are other teams that are like chomping at the bit to, to have a part in the analytics piece. Like I've seen teams that, you know, marketing teams will have analytics and components. The, the sales teams mm -hmm. will as well. So unless we take ownership of the of that data, of that capability and stop spending our time entering you know like entering spreadsheets onto a system and spend time analyzing where we're spending then you know we it, it's, a, it's a small opportunity and a small window to take advantage oh for 100 percent, and i think like just to add to that right like when you look at the composition of the c-suite right you've got a lot of different stakeholders in there i think another great opportunity for cfos is to go partner with two key members right Go partner with your technology officer or your information officer and your operations officer, right? Yeah. When I look back at my career in, in, in finance and leading high growth organizations and building them up, 
I always, my key stakeholders were always revenue. They were always operations and they were always HR, right? Why were those always my key stakeholders? Because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with the operations of the organization and how you're driving business, right? And to me, I think like it is, it, finance is poised, right? We're positioned inside the organization that we see all the different stories and all the different end results that come along in all of those suites, right? Like when I partnered with the CROs, right? Like I was always upstream and proactive in looking at deals from lead to opportunities, how they convert to pipeline, what are we learning? Because ultimately at the end of the day, what that's gonna give me is cash, revenue, and upsell, cross-sell, and incremental ways of building that business going forward, right? So to me, how we capture this moment is we gotta move upstream. We gotta go move and like entrench ourselves with these business partners and go learn those businesses. It's so surprising to me that most CFOs, like if you ask them, what drives your business and how your business makes money? There's a lot of CFOs that are like, uh, like I, I know the industry that we're in and I can quantify that, but, but really, like, do you know your customer? Do you know what it's like to be a solutions architect in a sales role? Do you know what it's like to be an SDR in a marketing organization, right? Like, there's so much opportunity for us to go further upstream and be proactive in building those relationships because ultimately like what we can do is build the connections downstream, right? We can take the CRO, all their sales strategy, all their plans that they want to execute. How does that bottom, how does that drive bottom line results around revenue, expenses, or cash? We can connect the dots and we're right in the center for those different functional areas to help build that community to connect those dots. Oh, amazing. I love that. And being that connection point, think of it, that puzzle piece in the middle. Because like, let's be honest, finance historically has been really siloed, right? They've had, they've Thanks. taken, and, and, I, and I'm very open to this, they've taken a lot of rubbish from the rest of the organization and had to find ways to turn it into great reporting, you know, gold at the end of the day. And actually now there is 100% of conversations to talk about how we embed finance in operations, in sales and marketing, in in those different areas and, and support them to drive better processes, better data, better visibility. Because then, you know, finance gets to step back and go, actually, I don't have to deal with what you're giving me. I'm driving it, like you said, upstream. I'm actually driving the results in the way that I want to and taking that board, which is super exciting, isn't it? Like, I think we could geek out on what the future of finance could look like for absolutely hours, which um, I'll try very much to do. So um, let's talk a little bit about partnering, because obviously partnering and business partnering has been a key part of how you've been, um, how you've worked in finance, particularly with those high growth companies. What does good business partnering look like to you? I think the first thing, and I, I get this a lot, and people always ask me, like, what does it mean to be a great finance business partner, right? The first off, in any relationship, finance business partnership is about building relationships, right? Um, and to me, any successful relationship are built on two core competencies. The first one is trust, and the second one is like competency, right? And historically, most finance organizations, most CFOs, most accountants, most finance p a people, when they go about building that relationship, the first element, and this is the wrong way to go. So for all those listeners, don't start with this pillar. We go with the competency, right? We want to show our business partners that we know our Excel, we know our US GAAP, we know our IFRS, we know our policies and procedures, we know our numbers. So when we go about building that relationship with the biz with our business partners, we're leading with competency, right? We're going to that chief marketing officer and saying, hey, by looking at this, uh, by looking at your budget and actual comparison, you're over budget by 15%. Can you explain to me in this spreadsheet of why you're over 15% and what this looks like in the future, right? That that's the wrong place to go. The first place that we need to start is go build the trust inside the business, right? So how do you go about building that trust? The first way that I always go back, if there's one takeaway for all the listeners and people looking at this, go ask that business partner, that CRO, that VP of sales, that operations leader, what are the problems, opportunities, and challenges that you see in your business and how can I serve you? That is the most important part because historically, fine, the, the business has served finance. They have served our models. They have served our policies. They have served 
our procedures. We need to flip that around. We need to serve the business. And when you go ask those questions and you begin serving the business, now you're building that trust. I've always looked at it as I want to build trust in the business in the trenches, right? I want to build it in, in operations. I want to build it when things are, are not sunshine and roses and we may be going through some challenges. So to me, financial business partnership, the cornerstone of it is built on trust and, I, and trust and building on that competency, which to me, are, that's an effective way of building a relationship. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that whole concept of who finance is within the organization. Because if you think about it historically, it's always mm -hmm. been the police. Yeah, we talked about policies right. and procedures, controls, no, you're over budget, right? And I, I try to remember which episode it was, but I had a cracking conversation with the CFO. And he said, look, my job is literally to help the business make better choices about where they should spend mm -hmm. their resource. It's not to tell them no, right? It's to go, right, if you do this, this is the impact. But hang on a second, here's a much better place to spend that resource, that, whether that's people, whether that's money, whatever it is. And, and I think that's a really interesting mindset shift. And like you said, like the perception of finance is so far away from that, that end goal in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, that I love that idea of flipping and that saying, look, how can I help? What is it you need from me? Um, and what are the challenges and problems that you currently have that I could potentially help you with, which is, you know, absolutely exactly. the way we should be. Exactly. And I think like to your point, I want to give a shout out to Alana Estridge, who's a CFO, a great mentor of mine. She put it very well. She said, you need we need a shift from CFO no to CFO go. Right. Yeah. Like exactly. we need to be in that organization because a lot of times. Right. And I, I've worked with so many different professionals and they always work with me and they're like, Chris, you're one of the first CFOs I've ever worked with or one of the first finance leaders I've ever worked with where you actually listen. Like there is there is one if there's one superpower that a lot of CFOs can take and get out of your technical skills. Like everybody knows you're great at these technical skills. Right. Go be a great listener to the business, right? Go just listen. Go have conversations and listen to people, like actively like listen. And to me, I think that's like a superpower because as you listen and as people feel like you're being heard, right? Now you can come and better understand versus like a lot of times in finance, we, we, we solve problems, right? Like we see a situation happen the first thing we want to go do is like come up with solutions. Hey, business, you need to go do A, B, C, and D to go fix this overrun or the sales problem or this customer retention problem. Here's the solutions you need to go do versus like being proactive, taking a step back and saying, you know what? I want to listen to the business. Like, what do they see? Like, what are some pains that they're having? Again, that overall opportunity we have, listen to the business pain then you can turn that into productivity. And when you do that for the business, you build great relationships and you build like that camaraderie, right? You build that healthy friction inside the organization. Yeah, and I, I like that terminology of healthy friction, right? There, there is a point, isn't it? You don't, you don't grow, you know, and, you know, the most exciting innovations and cultures don't grow in an environment where everything stays the same where there's no challenge, there's no problem to solve. Um, but exactly what you said that has to be done. It has to be healthy. It needs to be non-toxic, it needs to be done away. So what do you, how do you define healthy friction and how do you know when it's good friction versus not so good? Yeah, I've been in both situations. I've seen, I've been in situations where it is like, it is not friction. It is like, it, it, we're butting heads, <laughs> right? I think a healthy way of friction, right? And to, I, I know love that. All my CFOs, Pistols at all dawn, my right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like we're going to battle. Like we're putting the gloves on. It's like we're going to meet outside and have a nice little, like, uh, nice little talking <laughs> to, a nice little, like, scrimmage with each other, right? And uh, I think most of the time, and all my CFOs and, v and VPs of finance and finance leaders, and you'll probably understand that healthy friction is probably with the sales organization, right? Like mm -hmm. most of the time it sits there. Um, yeah. And a lot of times that I've had that healthy fiction with that sales organization, it's not a lack of both passion, right? Like I sit across and have the opportunity to work with some tremendous sales leaders, right? The number one thing that I want them to understand is like, I'm here to support your growth. 
right? But I'm ultimately going to support the growth that's profitable for the business, right? So being kind of like that devil's advocate of like not saying no to ideas, but like one thing I always love to do with my sales leaders is pressure test, right? Where I'm like, hey, Chris, we need to go spend, like for example, we need to go spend an extra $50,000 in paid ads because, you know, we're not getting the, the marketing traction that we want to get. And I say, okay, like, how did you come up with that number? Like, walk me through the best way that you can ask that is like, help me understand how you arrived at that, right? Like when you say that question, it denutralizes the conversation, right? If you're coming from a place of like, hey, I'm seeking understanding. Can you please help me understand how you're looking at this strategy? How you're looking at this tactic? How do you arrive at that? Now you put that business partner not on the reactive, right? You're not coming to them and saying, you want to spend $50,000, but I just looked at your plan and you're over 60K. So like, how are you going to do that, right? Like, help me understand. And then when you start to connect the dots on those, then you can help them connect the dots and say, okay, I've listened to your strategy. I've listened to your tactics. I've listened to some of the metrics and milestones you want to metric. If we play this out, if we simulated this, Here's what could be the bottom line impact that this could have to the business, right? Here are the pros, here's the cons, here's the short-term risk, the long-term risk. You give them that holistic perspective because now you're not the scorekeeper in that business's eyes, right? You're the valued advisor, right? And the holy grail that where CFOs want to get to is you want them to be able to say, there's not a business decision that I make that I don't go seek the advice and consulting from my finance partner. When you've got business partners saying that about the finance organization, oh man, you're top 5%, you're a valued advisor. But it starts having those conversations. It starts seeking understanding, then be understood. That is, I think, one of the golden nuggets that I've always approached to handling that conflict and creating that healthy friction. Yeah, and I do think a lot of unhealthy friction comes from how people are targeted and rewarded as well sometimes like and, and I, I don't think this is necessarily sure. a CFO problem and I think this is one of the challenges with especially with high growth with SaaS organizations I see it a lot more is that the drivers are can be incredibly short term which you need to have in there but it's that support how does the CFO build a, a long-term shared strategy approach to the value of the organization because let's be honest the CFO has always got their eye on the long game um, you know where sure. are you going to be, um, and and I think it's it's helping the wider business to understand that and to like you say get behind it and to to understand the risks in what they're trying to do. And that's that's what I'm saying is that whole journey, right? Like yeah. one of the things I think is a superpower for CFOs of the future is like connection, connecting them on those dots because we're in the finance organization, right? We've seen a lead come all the way to a sales cycle, a sales cycle to a closed contract, to an implementation project, from an implementation project over to your client success, to a customer that you've had for 10 years. Like we see that entire journey, right? We are well positioned because now we can connect the dots to that organization, right? Yeah, hey, you want to go run this? Okay, like let's, let's, let's fact pattern this out. Like let's go through and what this will look like. And I think to me, like, that's one of the greatest strengths of CFOs is like, we're able to go in the marketing organization. We're able to go with the chief technology officers. We're able to go to the CEO. And here's the story, right? Here's that journey. Here's that what that can look like in the next six, eight, and 12 months. But we also have to be realistic, right? I think a lot of times organizations spend, and some organizations and some people listen to this right now, hopefully you're closing down your 2023 budgeting. If not, I hope you're close to wrapping it up. We have to make sure that we're balancing precision and accuracy in all the advice that we're giving, right? A lot of organizations spend so much time, energy, and effort to be precise, which to me, precision is I'm 95 to 98% confident of the assumptions and models that I'm presenting versus accuracy is like I'm 60 to 80% directionally accurate that it's going to go this way, right? We have to be really, really conscious of trying to have 12, 16 month precision on a forecasting model right now when there's so much volatility, there's so much uncertainty. My question is, why would you spend all that time, energy, effort and resources to have a false sense of perception when in two to three months your business can completely change? So to me, 
that's where we have to navigate and push back because you you may have visionary CFO CEOs, you may have visionary CROs that are thinking two, three years out and they want to do this modeling. I'm like, hey, look, okay, how do we get precise in the next 90 days? And how do we continue to have the, the milestones and the metrics to make those pivot or persevere conversations? So to me, that's just another point that I would add into that as well, is we have to be really realistic about where we want to be precise and where we want to be accurate. And I've actually seen it the other way in that the CFOs are trying to be so accurate, right? They take forever to put the models. And by the time they actually produce the models and get it out to the business and the business looks at it and understands it, it's already out of date. So for me, the really yeah. interesting piece is, is, is that precision. And you're saying 95, 98%, right? So many people are aiming for that 100% accuracy. And you genuinely have to go, actually, what is good enough? And, and that in finance can be a bit scary, <laughs> you know, to be able to sit oh, back and go, definitely. yeah, we, we're, it's not perfect. I, th- I think a lot of um, finance people are secret perfectionists when it particularly comes <laughs> yeah. to reporting. So it's, it's that balance, isn't it? Between yeah. speed, um, precision, and, you know, and also how realistic something is. It's like that agility versus precision versus the accuracy and confidence, right? Like yeah. to me, and I get to work with a lot of different clients and some of my clients are wrapping up their 2023 and I'm, I'm challenging their leadership team to think about like you, you just spent, and one exercise that I was doing is we quantified all the business hours, the finance hours, all the time, energy and effort from a resource perspective that was spent on a, a two month budgeting process, right? And now I'm like, hey, this is what we quantified, right? And I won't give the numbers, but it was it was astonishing when we looked at it. And I said, I want to revisit all this when we look at their budgets done in January and February, right? So to me, it's like, I, I, I'm challenging them to think about because like, when you think about precision, I want to be, pre- I'm going to be precise in the next like 90 to 120, 180 days, maybe the next six months, I want to have some level of precision of what I'm looking at, right? But where CFOs are trying to, they're they're trying to be precise in the next 12 months. Listen, go put a dartboard on your on your board right now. Go throw darts at it. You're probably as accurate as you can be in there, what you're doing with your modeling. So to me, it's shifting that mindset, right? It's shifting that mindset to say, why do you want to spend all this time, energy, and effort in this one, in this one to three month exercise that in one to three months when the business has happened, you're gonna throw that all out the window. You, we need to readjust. We need to be more agile. We need to have that that agility sprinkled in inside the organizations to make faster, quicker decisions. Oh, you're absolutely preaching to the converted here. And I think that's that's the exciting thing about finance is it is moving a lot faster. And, and again, it's that whole risk mindset, right? What assumptions are we making? Do we actually know what assumptions we're making? about the Mm -hmm. the macro and obviously the micro environments that we're working within um, and using that to to drive that. And and also let's not be precious. Um, I was speaking to, um, and you know, podcast um, sneak peek for those that haven't um, um, already listened to it, um, but had a fab, um, I was speaking to the professor of organizational behavior, right? And he was saying, that basically, um, once people have made a decision, it becomes harder and harder to turn it around and say, actually, I wasn't right. I'm going to go do something completely different. And I think that's one of the hardest things, particularly when it comes to modeling, when it comes to budgets, when it comes to financial decisions, is actually going, it was right. And if that, but if I knew what I knew now, it's I wouldn't make that decision again. And that's that's a scary place for CFOs to be, to say, actually, I'm not. I'm not infallible. I don't know everything. I don't have this magic ball that's sitting on my lovely desk um, to, to actually have those open conversations with the business as well. Most definitely. And the thing I always stress with CFOs is like, and I've done this in myself, I've always sat with the business. Listen, you can do the most extravagant model. You can have the most fine-tuned budget drivers and assumptions. Mm-hmm. They're all going to be wrong, right? <laughs> There's not one time in my professional career where I did a model and it was 100% accurate to exactly what I modeled out. It never happened. So I think like, and that and that that challenges to a point we talked about earlier, that comfort zone, right? We as CFOs have to be comfortable. And that's what I'm getting, getting back to the first time we talked, 
those CFOs that were comfortable in chaos and still help navigate businesses, that's a whole muscle that we flex, right? We're so used to saying, hey, we got to be super accurate. We got to be 100% right. No, you've got to be comfortable in the gray. A lot of businesses, a lot of industries, a lot of the macro uh, econ economic, the global things that we're seeing, there's no black or white to it. Get comfortable and find confidence in the gray. And I love that. So, you know, that whole piece about the gray. So how did you get comfortable in the gray? You're obviously, you're, you're, you're loving it, right? You live, you're obviously living it and maybe a little bit of blue at the same time. So, um, so, so what, what does, what does, what does it take for a CFO to be able to step out of that traditional finance mindset and to be comfortable, comfortable in chaos and comfortable in uncertainty? I think the first thing for me, and this is probably more of a personal thing that I like to share with everybody is, um, you know, for me uh, personally, um, I picked up boxing. Uh, I fought competitively for about four or five years. Right. And I was actually like, and maybe not a lot of people know this, so I'll share something personal, but like I uh, was an amateur boxer. I had uh, multiple different fights and you talk about getting comfortable in chaos, like, <laughs> being comfortable when like punches and all this stuff is going on. It really helped translate to me in, in business, right? Because at the end of the day, and my boxing coach taught me this, and this is a philosophy that I've always had in business and just pretty much all of my life, right? There's only really two options of any situation. Either you're going to win or you're going to learn, right? Failure is never an option because if you learn from that failure, it's actually a learn, right? So like I look at opportunities and yeah, I fail. I continue to fail in my business. I failed so many times in my career, but I've learned from those opportunities, right? And when I've learned from them, the second thing is I learn from them. And the most important aspect that CFOs need to do, you need to be transparent, right? Now is not the time for CFOs to fake it till you make it. Those times are gone. I was always in say, look, I made a mistake. I was wrong. This is what I learned from it. This is what I'm going to take to improve the business forward and going forward, right? Now, granted, those those learning opportunities, it wasn't like, you know, multi-millions and dollars in mistakes, but I've had those in my career too. So I think taking that opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to have a growth mindset through this because if I'm going, to, I'm going to learn from it, the business is going to be better. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be transparent. And I'm going to, I'm going to take a mindset that no matter the situation, we're going to grow through it and thrive through it. We're not going to go through the situation. We're going to grow through it. And to me, that is that comfort level, I think, comes from, you know, for me, like that was always something that I just had in, in my life. Right. Like I grew up from a very humble background, grew up in a single parent background where, you know, I had to learn and, and build and, and, and develop myself. Right. Um, so to me, for those CFOs that are looking to take, you got to like go find those opportunities inside the business to get those learning opportunities, right? Like I get questions in LinkedIn and so many people reach out to me and they're like, Chris, man, how did you get this? Like what courses did you take? What books did you read? What conference did you go to? And I'm like, it's been none of that, right? <laughs> most of everything that you're going to learn, you got to actually go and do it in your role. Like go find those opportunities, go find those questions, go uncover that, that pain in your mind that you've been thinking about where it's like, man, I should go partner with a person because I think there's opportunity for us to make an impact on the business. Like go seek those opportunities, go find those minimum viable projects, those MVPs where you can start building that confidence. You can start flexing those, those muscles inside of the uncertainty and building that confidence. So that would be my recommendation. I'm not recommending people go box, like don't go pick up boxing or like <laughs> punchy people. I'm not recommending that, but Find those opportunities to build those MVP projects. Absolutely, yeah. And opportunity to put yourself to the test is what we're saying here. Like you said, doesn't have to require a, a set of boxing gloves to do it, but, well, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fabulous. Well, you know, Chris, we're, we're coming to the end of the podcast and we still haven't had a chance to talk. Um, we talked a lot about your journey and your philosophy on finance, which I love, by the way. But tell us a little bit about Fresh FPNA. You know, what are you guys doing over there? <laughs> yeah, so Fresh FPNA, we're consult a consultancy focused on finance transformation and scalable solutions for businesses. Basically, what we do is we help finance organizations 
transform and scale their finance operation by providing factorial CFO and consulting services. Uh, we work with all different organizations from seed to enterprise level companies um, for fractional CFO work. We do a lot of work around demystifying what is financial transformation and help organizations develop the vision, the strategy, the tactics, the milestones and metrics over the next six, eight, 12 and 18 months. So that way they can conquer the elephant that is financial transformation. And then also as well, we do a lot of thought leadership in the global accounting, finance, FP&A, and CFO space. Um, I'm always at conferences speaking and networking and connecting with people. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about fresh FP&A. And like I said, our entire value proposition is like, we want to bring that fresh perspective on finance. We have a golden opportunity to rewrite the legacy of what it means to be an FP&A and CFO uh, professional of the future. And I'm so thankful and humbled to be able to support a global community. And uh, yeah, that's what Fresh FP&A does. Fabulous. And it is lovely to meet somebody as passionate about transformation as I am. You know, I think the more people we get excited about the opportunity and more people to see it as an opportunity, you know, the, the better the future looks for finance. So thank you so much, Chris, for joining me on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure and I expected nothing less if I'm being really honest. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much, Hannah. To everybody listening, um, if you want to connect with me or follow me, I'm all over LinkedIn. You can follow me at Chris Ortega. If you want to learn more about Fresh FPNA, check out my website, www.freshfpa.com. Um, or if you're curious and want to connect with me, you can email me. Thank you so much, Hannah, for the time. No, absolutely. And for those of you that are listening, usual um usual way we will put all of the links that Chris mentioned into the show notes made nice and easy for you so thanks again Chris thanks guys for listening and we'll see you next time thank you